Hello, hi, welcome. Um, welcome to this uh, GMAT Club session on choosing the right business school. Uh, my name is Julianne Heafy and I am a senior consultant with MBA Mission. And uh, in a minute, I am going to be um, showing you a presentation and sharing my screen. Um, so hold on for just a second uh, while I get that going and then we will launch the uh, presentation. Hope you guys are well. Um, there's some chat over on the side and some comments. Um, just know that when once I launch the presentation, I am not going to be uh, able to read that until the end. So you're welcome to put your questions in uh, now or as I go or even at the end and I'll deal with them um, after the presentation. We'll definitely leave some time for Q&A, okay? So uh, with that said, uh, let's get started. Um, give me one second just to share my screen. And we will launch it right now. Okay. Um, great. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am, as I mentioned, Julianne Heafy. I'm a senior consultant with MBA Mission Admissions Consulting. And we're gonna talk about choosing the right business school today. Um, really, the business school decision is a big decision. There are a lot of factors that go into it. Um, you're certainly making a big investment of time and money. And um, you really wanna make sure that you make the right decision when it comes to selecting the list of schools to apply to. So we're gonna take you uh, from kind of like an overview position of all the different factors that you might want to consider before you make this big decision and um, help you figure out a little bit more of where your priorities and preferences might lie. Um, so just to let you know, um, again, my name's Julianne. I'm, uh, I'm with MBA Mission. Prior to that, I was working in strategy consulting. I approached the admissions uh, process is in sort of the same way by taking a strategic look at who's applying and what their needs are and what's going to get uh, candidates on their best path and uh, presenting them in the best light. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, my school, Harvard Business School along the way. Also Tuck, which uh, is the business school where I went to undergraduate at Dartmouth College. So. I have some uh, some connections to a couple of schools, um, but we'll cover the whole process. Um, so the first part of our program is choosing the right type of MBA program. We're gonna go over all the different uh, considerations that you might have. And then we're going to figure out which ones might be the right ones for you. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna leave some time for a little bit about what we do at MBA Mission and some Q&A. Okay, so let's jump in with section one, which is finding the right type of MBA program. So I think the first thing to think about when you're thinking about what kind of MBA program is right for you is a little bit of, well, where are you in the experience level and time commitment um, frame, frame of mind. So um, we have MBA, we have, which we're talking about full-time MBA programs here, with generally two-year programs, okay? Uh, often with a summer internship, although there are some that sort of start in January and go straight through. Um, but for the most part, you're on campus full-time and uh, in a two-year long program in the U.S. Um, then you're gonna have the part-time MBA. For those programs, you're mostly going to be working and attending uh, your MBA program at night or on the weekends. And then finally, you have your EMBA, which stands for Executive MBA. And there are all different flavors of that. Um, again, the time commitment might vary. It might be one or two years. It kind of depends on how often you're attending the program and how it's organized. Uh, but again, you might be attending every every weekend or maybe you're going to go in larger chunks a little bit more infrequently. So that's just kind of a, a, a quick uh, understanding of the time commitment that it's going to be requiring on your part. 
Um, in terms of some of these other considerations here, you know, some other things that are some differences across these different programs are, well, are you in a fixed cohort of people? Are you basically starting and ending with the group that you go in with? And for the MBA and for the executive MBA, that answer is yes. So you're going to have a class. Um, Part-time MBAs work a little bit differently because people may be beginning or ending at different points in time. They may pause for a while and come back. So you have a much more fluid uh, collection of people that you're studying with. And um, your stage of career, you know, generally uh, in the U.S. anyway, um, you're seeing uh, certainly a trend toward more experience over time. Um, back, you know, 40 years ago, people went uh, pretty young into business school, but now uh, generally people have gotten some strong professional experience first, no matter what program you're going into. So the MBA and even the part-time MBA, you're going to be looking at usually having at least four or five years before you start for the most part. Are, of course, with some exceptions. Um, but that's sort of the average. If you look at the different school profiles for the top schools, you're going to notice that that's about the age that people are starting those programs. The executive MBA, generally speaking, is going to have maybe 12 to 15 years. There are some programs that take people a little bit younger, mid-career EMBAs. Um, but for the most part, these are going to be for the senior people who are uh, in your organization, who didn't go earlier, who are looking to advance in their careers. Um, and then management experience is a mixed bag, you know, MBA, part-time MBA, they prefer it, but you don't necessarily have to have, you know, managed divisions or teams of people yet. Um, but for an EMBA, it's pretty mandatory. And then if you're thinking about, you know, am I making a career pivot or not? You're definitely going to run into um, certainly people who are staying with their career at uh, any one of these, um, but it's going to be easier to be making that career pivot for the most part for the MBA and somewhat for the part-time MBAs. Um, executive MBAs really oftentimes are sponsored by their company, so um, certainly it's going to be uh, difficult for them to switch careers at the end of that because they've just been sponsored. So. Um, rarely you will find a career changer. Of course, things happen. Um, but for the most part, those are people who are being um, uh, sort of chosen to take this advanced step uh, to uh, get a promotion in their career to take on more at the company where they are already working. Okay. Um, so now let's kind of talk about FIT, which is finding the right target school for you. Um, so it's all well and good that, um, you know, certain people might have a list of rankings, but really you want to go beyond those rankings to figure out what's the right fit for um, what you're looking to get out of your MBA program. So in terms of the differentiators, uh, you know, here's a list of nine uh, specific things that you might consider as you begin to sort of sort the programs in your mind. Um, one of the big things is length of program. Uh, I mentioned a minute ago that for the full-time MBAs, the vast majority of them uh, in the U.S. anyway are going to be two-year programs. But there are some other programs that are shorter that might be a one-year MBA. There are a couple here in the U.S. with Kellogg Stern come to mind. Um, but then also a lot of the non-U.S. programs uh, in Europe or Asia uh, might be uh, only a year long. So it really uh, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, location is another differentiator. Um, class size and structure, you should really uh, start to think about how big uh, a program you want to be joining. Uh, they really vary, and we'll show some graphs a little bit later that will help you picture the different sizes of the schools. Um, curriculum, you know, some people really haven't, when they're starting the process, haven't really thought about how different these programs could be. So we'll um, dive in to talk about a few different types of programs that you might run into. Uh, pedagogy, uh, again, method of instruction, how do they teach their classes? You might be surprised to learn that, you know, these are not all the same approaches, that schools have very different philosophies on what is the right way to teach business school or what is the way that fits with their vision for their program. Um, so we'll dive into that. 
Um, academic specializations and recruitment. Um, if you're looking to pivot careers, that might be something that you're very interested in so that you can really um, dig deep into a specific area and uh, build an expertise in an area that you might not previously have strength in. Um, alumni base, that could be important. If you're in uh, a role or you're trying to get into an industry where networks are critically important, you'll want to consider the size of the network, uh, the strength of the network, and um, where those people are, of course. And uh, facilities, that's another thing to think about. Or do you need something with uh, the most recent technology center? Um, a lot of business schools have been building new buildings, launching new programs. Um, what are the facilities like at the schools that you're targeting? And then uh, we put this last rankings and reputation because um, look, uh, I think they vary a lot from year to year and you can put all the top names into a, into a jar and shake them up and spill them out in different orders every year. But you, you'll find that the top schools, you know, they trade places a little bit in different lists. We'll rank one school first one year and fourth the next. I, I think overall you wanna consider the overall strength of the program in the rankings without uh, worrying too much about who's third versus second one year, especially because that program might not be the right fit for you considering all the other things we just mentioned. Um, and just a tip, uh, on the MBA Mission website, we have uh, a lot of insider's guides for the US programs that go into depth about these uh, individual schools. So check those out and you'll get a really good sense of um, where your school fits in terms of all of these, uh, in terms of all of these qualities. We also have some international programs there. So uh, do look at our, our website to get those insider's guides. That'll really help you, uh, especially now when it's a little bit difficult to easily visit. Okay, um, so finding the right target schools, we mentioned a minute ago, the length of the program. So just to kind of show you, um, I mentioned before that some of the uh, non-US programs uh, tend to be shorter. You can see right here, you know, if you're looking at um, LBS, there's a little bit of a flexibility there. There are shorter and longer programs. Um, NSAAD has a, has a January start and they have like an August, September start for its programs. And those differ a little bit in format and length. The January program includes an opportunity to do a little bit of an internship. But you might consider that if you're selecting a shorter program, there may or may not be an internship opportunity within there. So if you're pivoting careers, you might be opting, you might want to be opting for a longer program that has that so that you can make inroads into an employer or an industry um, that you're trying to target. Um, and then Oxford, Cambridge, 12 months. Um, again, the start dates are all a little bit different, but for the most part, these programs will be starting in the fall. Um, okay, differentiator number two is uh, location. Um, something to think about is where you're going to be studying. And there are a number of different um, settings and environments for these business programs. Some of them are smack dab in the really big city. Um, some of them are more in like a college town, college setting or suburban setting. And others are really in a rural environment. And so some of the things that you might think of as you begin to consider this is well, what's it like to go to school in those different environments. On an urban campus, um, one thing that you might um, notice is that uh, it's very decentralized. Uh, lots of times people might choose to go to uh, a school in a city where they want to be long-term employed and maybe they're already working there. They're not necessarily going to move and live on campus if they are already living in that city. Um, and then if you're a new person coming to that city, the area where the school is may not have a lot of housing for what you need or it may be very expensive because living in an urban uh, setting uh, can be pricey. So if you think about NYU, it's right in Greenwich Village. That's a pretty pricey area to be living in. People might be commuting and taking the subway there from locations, you know, in Brooklyn or um, farther afield in Manhattan 
or even uh, some people might be um, driving in from you know areas outside of outside of the city. So you just have to consider that it's um, more of a decentralized population. So community building might be a little bit more difficult um, and it might be more expensive. Um, but on the plus side, you know, a lot of people really might want to make inroads into the community um, that they're targeting where the school is. So let's say you know you wanna live in Chicago in the long term, you know, living there while you're going to school, you'll be building your network even before you graduate. You'll be, um, you know, inter able to interview with pr uh, employers uh, on a very impromptu basis. Um, you might have the opportunity to do things like in-term internships. So sometimes that can be a really attractive option if you are um, trying to make advancements into a particular city while you're in school. Um, college town is another option. Um, oftentimes those are really fun to kind of go back to uh, your undergraduate days a little bit. It's uh, intimate. You're going to find uh, much more affordable housing usually, depending on the area. Certainly it'll be geared more to the college and uh, graduate school population. And uh, oftentimes they, because they have these larger universities attached to them, you're going to find a really uh, active and strong placement and recruiting network there. So uh, definitely something to think about. Um, uh, so there we have a little bit of a chart of where some of these top business schools fall on the spectrum. So you can see some urban campuses here, Chicago, uh, Columbia, New York, Harvard and, and MIT in Boston, um, NYU in New York. I, I'm going to argue here that UCLA is, you know, maybe a little bit more of a college hybrid. If you guys have ever been to LA, you'll know it's a bit of a sprawling city. Um, and Westwood, which is where UCLA is, is uh, a very leafy, um, I would say much more of a college uh, part of Los Angeles than say, you know, USC, which is in another part of town. Um, urban college hybrids, that's where I would probably put UCLA and you might see Northwestern Kellogg, which is in Evanston outside of Chicago. Um, Stanford's in uh, Silicon Valley and Palo Alto, so not quite in San Francisco, but more outside. Um, and even Berkeley, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a big college town with uh, UC Berkeley, lots of schools there and a very active student population that uh, dominates the town. Um, and then you'll have college towns, some of which are quite rural. I would say that Dartmouth Tuck, uh, which is the business school um, attached to Dartmouth College, which is where I went, is in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's in New England. It is not super close to any major metropolis. Um, you really are getting away. And um, the good thing about that is you can really build a strong, uh, strong community, really tight bonds. Uh, that's one thing that Dartmouth Tuck is known for. Um, Duke Fuqua is another one of those. Um, Michigan Ross is in Ann Arbor. Um, it's definitely a, certainly a university town, but um, you know, might be a little bit more set back. And uh, UVA Darden, you know, that campus is a little bit even set apart from the undergraduate campus in Charlottesville. So definitely more of an, uh, a rural setting. Okay, and then for you can see for some of these other schools, um, we have some European schools here. Um, if you want to be in the heart of London, you know, you can look at London Business School. Um, and Sead, if you're going to the Singapore campus, you're definitely in the city. If you're in uh, Fontainebleau and uh, outside of Paris, it's really more of the college town. Okay, um, now let's look at uh, class size and structure. So we're gonna define a large class as more than 400 students um, and a small class as fewer than 400. So a uh, bit of an arbitrary split, but in, in a minute, you're gonna see how those lay out on a chart. So when you have a large class size, you know, you have to accept that the bigger it gets, the harder it is for you to meet and get to know everybody in it. You're just gonna graduate and know that you're maybe not gonna know the name of everybody in the program. Um, whereas if you're in a smaller school, you really build those tight bonds and you're probably going to know everybody there. 
um, a large class size, you're going to have a bigger immediate network and a bigger alumni network. Um, but that being said, because it's so large, sometimes people don't feel uh, necessarily quite as attached to it as if it's a small class size where you really have, you know, kind of this sense of partnership and um, like you're all in a club together. Um, so you'll find that some of the cl smallest class sizes have some of the most powerful networks. Um, other things to consider, um, you know, uh, if you like anonymity, obviously a larger class size is going to be more for you. Um, but uh, you may face more competition, uh, particularly for things like club leadership. If you want to be the head of the finance club or the consulting club, you're competing against that many more people to potentially do it. So if you want to run conferences, you know, that might be a little bit harder um, to get that plum position um, if you're at a larger school. More competition for those opportunities. Um, so here's the graphic I was mentioning before, and you can really see the difference here. I mean, look at Harvard. It's all the way out on the right, um, really more than double the size of, of most of these schools. So um, HBS 938, um, Wharton, another big one at 856, and Columbia 754. Um, those three schools, I would say, one of the things that they all do is they do break that down into chunks. So, you know, Wharton has um, cohorts and clusters to create a smaller population. So you might not know it, all 856 people in the program, but you're probably going to know, you know, your smaller group. Um, at HBS, where I went, uh, your first year, you spend with the same, you know, 80, 90 people in your section. And there's, you know, 10, 11, 12 sections. Um, when I went, there were 11. I'm not sure what it is right now. It's around that size. Um, and you really build a tight bond with those people. You can predict what they're going to say by the time you get to the end of that year. So I might not know everybody that I was in my um, whole whole class with at HBS, but I definitely know everybody in my section. Um, and Columbia, you know, Columbia, keep in mind, there are two different start dates for the Columbia Business School program. There's a January start date that takes about 300 of those people. And those folks, I'm sure, get to know each other quite well, versus the August folks who um, start at a different time. Um, they all join up again in the second year, and it's a bit more of a mix. But you know, it's a the, this chart is a little misleading because it it doesn't quite convey that Columbia's really got two different entering populations in here. Um, okay, Chicago is a really big school. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about how they're organized, and then you can see all the way down to Tuck, uh, Haas, uh, Johnson. Those are really small, under three hundred people. Um, for the non-US programs, you're going to see that some of these are quite a bit different from others. Um, Cambridge is only 200 people, um, whereas uh, LBS, you know, more than double that. So keep in mind that the different programs that you're looking at, um, really, if you're fitting everybody into the room, they would look quite different. Okay. Um, another differentiator is class size and structure. Um, sh we're going to take uh, Chicago Booth here all the way down to MIT Sloan. Um, you can see I mentioned before the sections with HBS is 90 people in your section, but some of these will have smaller ones. Chicago Booth has no sections. Uh, really, their entire um, time that you're there, everybody takes one course in common. But other than that, you may have two people going to Chicago that take entirely different classes while they're there. So um, really a mix. You can have your own pathway through that school, and you're really not necessarily going to have that shared experience that you might have at, say, HBS, where you are sitting in the same room with the same 90 people for your entire first year um, taking the course. And nobody places out of it. So even if you have been working um, in banking or financial engineering for five years, you're still going to be taking the same economics um, and finance and um, accounting classes as people who have never once taken um, those classes who are coming from completely different industries and might be marketing gurus or um, operations people, um, engineers, 
who are leading teams at factories. So really um, uh, no, no placing out of those classes and a really shared experience no matter what. Um, and there's a bit of a philosophy around that. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, here's some other schools. Um, again, there's a real mix of whether you have a core or you don't have a core, whether you have sections where you're sort of with a, the same group of people for some portion of the year, um, or whether you don't have sections. There's a, a real difference there. Um, and again, in the non-US programs, you really see the same variety. You know, some will have all of their classes taken together throughout the entire program, and then the other ones are gonna really have varied experiences. So um, think about that when you're thinking about, well, what kind of you know, experience do I wanna have with the classes I wanna take? Um, and a little bit more in depth on that, you know, we talked about the core curriculums. Um, how flexible are they versus how mandatory are they? We mentioned a minute ago that um, HBS has a mandatory fixed curriculum in its first year. It's not the only one. It's Tuck and Darden. Um, part of that is because um, the reason that they do that is that they uh, believe in a case method of instruction, which we'll talk about that in a second where you know the students are really the teachers just as much of the, as the professors are so even though you're not placing out of it that might place a little bit more of a burden on you to uh, contribute what you know um, the flexible curriculum you're going to run into that at chicago booth mit sloan the student's going to be um, identifying their uh, his or her um, academic needs and but you know that's which gives them lots of flexibility to really front load courses in a new area if they're trying to get a job in a new um, industry which is really great if you're if you're trying to pivot um, but on the other hand you really have to go in there with a plan so you got to be prepared day one these business school programs are short and there's not a lot of time for exploration at a, at a school with um, one of these um, less required curriculums, okay? So, um, and you might have, as a result, a, a limited shared experience or looser social bonds because you're not necessarily um, spending a huge amount of time with the same people. Um, okay, uh, and you can see again here in this chart, you know, how much of their program is core, um, can you place out of them, and um, just some comments on those. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, HBS is gonna have 50% core, that's your entire first year. Um, and there are no exceptions to the rule. Other schools will allow you, they'll have a core like Ross, um, but they will allow you to potentially place out of things. Okay, um, here's some more schools that do that. Again, lots of variety, but you'll notice that, you know, it's not like everybody's taking the entire core curriculum, their entire experience, most of them are gonna come to some portion of their first year, either the whole first year or maybe the first term or something in between. Um, when you get to the non-US programs, you'll actually notice that some of the core uh, curriculum uh, percentages go up. And remember that these are one-year programs. So if you really want to be choosing and selecting and loading up on specific courses, maybe these are not the right programs for you because you might not have the flexibility to really do that. Okay, um, the next one is uh, pedagogy. Um, we're gonna talk about style of teaching. So uh, the real big um, two main groups that you run into, in addition to more hands-on stuff that we'll talk about in a second, are the case method and lecture style school. So, Case method, um, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, what a business school case might look like, but it might be anywhere from let's say 15 to 30 pages, and it'll be on a particular person, a protagonist, um, depending on the school, if it's a leadership class, for example, or it might be on a company, or it might be on a situation. So uh, really depends, a lot of them are on um, situations within a company. Um, and you'll have uh, a collection of paragraphs, you know, some written materials along with some exhibits, some of which may be relevant, some of which may not. And you're supposed to digest it all, uh, come up with a point of view, prepare certain questions, and then come in and really uh, talk about it in class. 
and it's um, very participatory. You, if you don't like speaking in front of 90 people every day, um, HBS might not be the right program for you. So you really have to be engaged. You have to make decisions. Your professor is going to put you on the spot and ask you what you would do in that situation and then change something about it and then go back to you. So um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work in the reading and you really have to be on your A game when you show up. Um, but it's often, you know, team-based, you might work with a study group to prepare. And, um, it's just very much of a, of a, of a different style of learning than what you might've seen in your undergraduate experience where it might be more lecture-based. So lecture-based are going to be more traditional instruction. You're going to have the, the professor teaching, uh, the vast majority of the class. There's going to be some participation, but not the, uh, huge percentage that you would see in a case method class. Um, and uh, then you're going to also see on this chart, you know, what percentage of the school's um, curriculum is experiential learning or team projects, things like that. So some schools are really uh, big on uh, labs and and projects. So um, I, you know, Sloan is one that springs to mind. Um, to see Fuqua, Michigan Ross is really hands on as well. So they're gonna have larger percentages of those team projects. And then other schools are gonna have less than that. Um, and you can see you know, what percentage of the um, curriculum is case method here. So um, Michigan Ross on the low end and HBS on the high. Again, you're gonna have a mix of the other schools. So the insider's guides are gonna go into all of this in more detail for all of these schools. So if there are some names on this list, that you want to dig into further, um, definitely download those insider's guides and take a look at how they're organized. Um, and here's some non-US schools, um, some of the European schools here, really a mix here. Um, case study at some, 75%, whereas at others, it's more like uh, 25%. So it really just depends on what you're looking for. Um, finally, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, another differentiator of academic specializations. Um, you know, you got to get behind the stereotypes here. One of the things you, that you hear all the time is that, oh, you know, uh, Columbia and Wharton, they're just a finance school. Um, Kellogg's great for marketing and that's it. Um, and that's really not true. I mean, Kellogg uh, is amazing for consulting. Um, it is very, places tons of people there every year. It's, it's uh, good for tech. Uh, increasingly over time, as most schools are, really increasing their place, placements in tech. Um, but it's also strong in finance. They have a whole finance scholarship um, that you can apply for that potentially could get you some scholarship money. So if finance is an interest of yours, don't overlook Kellogg. Um, Chicago Booth, Columbia, Stern, really they have lots of programs, not just finance. Um, Wharton's big push is to say that they're a finance and school, meaning that they're also really strong in other things um, like marketing. I think a lot of the really big uh, marketing um, revelations over the last few decades, some of them have come out of Wharton um, and uh, they have some really influential uh, leadership professors. Uh, you might know Adam Grant. Um, and they also have a really strong focus on entrepreneurship and scaling. So you'll see um, some really cool entre entrepreneurship programs there, and they just are uh, planning to unveil a huge new center for entrepreneurship at Penn uh, this fall. So, you know, don't overlook the, uh, the other things that these schools offer. They are not just their stereotypes. And there's a lot of resources, a lot of ways to learn about your target program. I know the visiting schools is really not uh, on the table right now for most of them, um, but I would say that you know summertime is generally not a super fantastic time to always see them anyway because most of them are not in session. So um, if you're applying early or you're applying in you know if you're applying uh, early, you might not get to see them uh, before you go, but maybe in the interview process things will be different and you'll be able to visit. Um, or if you're applying round two or in a future year, um, hopefully you'll be able to get on a campus and see some classes and, and meet some students. Um, you can also talk to alumni and current students. A lot of admissions offices are really going out of their way to make those connections right now. Um, you'll see webinars, you'll see um, YouTube um, sessions. So 
um, really lots of ways to connect with these programs that they're um, launching all the time uh, while visits are not happening. Um, you can also look at the MBA Mission blog. We profile professors, we talk about new developments at school. So if you um, go to our blog, every day we have new stories on there. So it's a great resource for learning about some of the programs and you can search on your particular program um, and everything tagged under, under that school will come up. Uh, and of course you can look at the admissions blogs. Um, so yeah, so we talked about a little bit the difference of those programs um, in terms of you know, other things that they're good at beyond the stereotypes. Uh, another differentiator is their alumni base. So, um, you know, some of them are going to have more of a regional focus than others. Some of them are going to have more of an international focus than others. So let's say you're looking at, um, you know, um, working in Europe and maybe you want to go to a school that's in Europe. Um, if you're really interested in staying in Chicago, you know, you might consider going to um, Kellogg or um, Booth more than you would say, you know, Texas McCombs. So um, you really want to be looking at where that network base really is strong. Um, you have to think about not just the number of alumni versus how connected they are and how much they'll go to bat for each other. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the smaller networks are some of the most passionate and are not only willing to take your call, but will connect you to three other people they know. So um, think about that uh, as well, because some of the ones with really huge networks, maybe that network's so big, big because they have a lot of part-time um, MBAs who have gone through the program and might not feel quite as connected because they were sort of commuters while they were doing it. Um, so if you look at the alumni base, you know, NYU Stern is really big there. And I think that is partially because of all these many programs that they have. Um, you know, Harvard has a huge alumni you, network. You would expect that because it has the biggest program of the regular MBA programs. And then you'll see that some of these other ones have really small networks. But consider that, you know, as I mentioned, the, the Dartmouth one is super passionate. So um, if you are looking for people who are really going to go out of your, their way to help you, you know, don't overlook Dartmouth talk. Um, okay, and then here's some of the European schools. You'll notice Cambridge really quite small compared to some of these other ones. And Sayad um, is uh, significantly bigger and so is IMD. So, um, but again, you'll see that some of these bigger ones are gonna be including these part-time PhD, EMBA programs. So, you know, is it the same as like an MBA network where they're all feeling really tied to the MBA? Um, facilities, you know, is another thing to consider. There's really kind of an arms race sometimes on campus where people are unveiling beautiful new centers. Um, it can affect the learning experience. Obviously, there may be resources that you want to take advantage of. Um, you know, if you want to launch a um, food, you know, startup or a, you know, uh, transportation startup, you might want to take a look at what their entrepreneurship labs are like, if they have facilities for that. Um, you know, if you're interested in healthcare, you know, maybe you want to take advantage of um, partnering with uh, uh, facilities across the broader campus and look at those as well. Um, you know, and then sometimes you'll just have like spectacular amenities, golf courses, gyms, you know, the Dartmouth Ski Way. Um, maybe the dorms have been newly renovated. You know, these are mo very cosmetic things a lot of the time, but, you know, they're great to take advantage of. Um, if you're going to be living there for a couple of years. So here's some schools with some new facilities. Um, you know, UVA Darden new facilities in DC opened in 2017. I was there last year and they were um, breaking ground. They're building some, some new um, recruiting center and um, uh, buildings there. Um, McCombs just launched a, a new hall a few years back. So you know, you just notice that there are some, um, some new facilities that have launched over the past few years. And then Columbia and Wharton, you know, Columbia is digging ground and um, building a whole new campus uh, opening in 2021. And Wharton's expecting to unveil that entrepreneurship building uh, this fall. And then last, consider uh, rankings and reputations. So, you know, yes, a school might be arbitrarily ranked number one by one publication in one year. But if you look at things like, you know, overall happiness, you know, maybe Iceland is at the top or 
um, you know, Denmark or whatever, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to run and uproot your life and move there, right? So you have to consider more than just a ranking, um, but really to consider, is this place a fit? Is this school program going to prepare me for my goals? Um, what kind of things do I need? What kind of things do I wanna build skills in and learn? What's my learning style? Um, and what kind of relationships do I wanna build while I'm there? The rankings will come and go. I think it's a good starting point to come up with a list of schools, um, but it's definitely not like, you know, apply to one through 10 on your list. If you're doing that, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. Um, so, and you can look, it's kind of arbitrary, you know, on one, on US News and World Report, you know, Dartmouth's nowhere. And then on Bloomberg, it's number two. And then Penn is, Penn Wharton is tied for one over here on the left. And then on the right, it's number six. So really these things fluctuate a lot year over year. And I think as long as you're looking at, you know, a great challenging school that's gonna prepare you for where you wanna go, and certainly as selective all these schools are, um, you'll be in good shape to start thinking about some of the other things you're trying to get out of the program. Um, yeah, and again, you know, here's some more further, further rankings, uh, really super arbitrary in a lot of ways. Uh, Financial Times, you know, okay, Harvard's number one. Uh, the Economist, no, Chicago Booth. So <laughs> it's a, a little bit uh, nutty with the rankings and every year they change them up, so it's, uh, it's a starting point, not an end point, as I said. Okay, and then again, same thing with the European schools. I mean, you'll notice it's really quite um, almost random seeming the way the schools shake out. Um, okay, and then, you know, just really thinking about just taking two schools, for example, um, just pulling them out of a hat from these top, top programs. I mean, Chicago Booth, Dartmouth Tuck, really great, amazing schools they are so super different from each other. So if you were just going on rankings and you're like, I'm applying to schools ranked number one through number 10 by The Economist or The Financial Times or whatever, you know, you're gonna see, um, you're gonna either be living in Chicago, the third most populous city in the US or Hanover, which is tiny. Um, you're gonna have 580 people in your class with no sections, so you may never run into half the people or you're going to be living in a you know really um, more remote environment, but you're building really tight bonds with your class of 285. Um, you're gonna either have a flexible teaching method where people are picking all their courses, um, you know, differently from each other, or you're going to have um, a case emphasis and much more fixed sections. Um, core curriculum, you're going to have a loose core, really not much of a core at all, or you're going to have your entire first year be um, plotted out. So, and then recruiting specialization, you know, is Chicago Booth only finance? I would argue no, um, but, uh, you know, Tuck isn't only consulting either. So, um, thinking about that. And then your alumni base, um, 55,000 for Chicago Booth. That includes, of course, they have a lot of part-time programs and some other um, some other things that feed into that, of course. Whereas Dartmouth Tuck um, has a much smaller network, but it could be an advantage if they everybody's really working to return your calls. Um, Okay, so um, I'll just talk a minute about MBA mission and then um, I'm going to uh, bail out of this presentation to flip to Q&A in a minute. So just for a second, um, we are um, an admissions consulting firm um, that really believes in um, top level service. We've been rated number one by Poets and Quants. We're the highest rated firm on GMAT Club with more than a thousand verified five-star reviews. Um, we're the, maybe some of you guys know Manhattan Prep for your GMAT and GRE preparation. Um, we're the only admissions consulting firm recommended by them. They used to recommend a few, now it's only us. Um, we are all full-time consultants in admissions. Um, so a lot of the other firms you might not realize um, either are entirely part-time or mostly part-time, um, whereas for us, this is our full-time focus all year long. It is what we do. We are really immersed with it. 
um, and really focused on your success in the admissions process as opposed to another job and then you know, you're a side gig. Um, we have a ton of collaboration among us. We have an annual conference. Uh, we all communicate with each other regularly to um, get, share information and updates. So uh, really you're kind of getting the power of the entire team every time you have a question. <laughs> Um, and we're very selective, uh, really it's quite the application process to get hired. So, um, there are many more opportunities to try us that we have events all the time like this, um, go to our website. We have tons of information there, all free, um, interview primers, insider's guides, start to finish admissions guide, um, and blog, blog entries as well. Um, in terms of services, we offer a variety of services from the start to finish package where we are um, giving you um, soup to nuts in the admissions process, walking you through the entire thing. And hourly services, which are much more um, targeted to the exact part of the process that you need help with. Um, we also run mock interview sessions and uh, team-based discussion simulation for Wharton. So, um, really take a look on our website. All of the different uh, options are there and uh, very transparently laid out. Um, our team, you know, this is these are just some selected members. You can see we have a variety of experiences, lots of different business schools, um, lots of different work experiences that might tie with yours. Um, take a look on the website for our bios. Um, and then this is the address of the website, www.mbamission.com. If you have a if you want to reach out to our administrative team, info at mbamission.com. And to sign up for a consult, you can go to our website. It's mbamission.com slash consult. And uh, again, lots of resources on there. OK, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we'll get to your questions. Hello. <laughs> So um, yeah, let's go right from the uh, first one that's been selected for me here. Um, so will obtaining an EMBA from a top 15 business school allow me to pivot into consulting if I don't have experience, but I have transferable skills? Yeah, so I mean, I mentioned this a little bit before. Um, it's harder to um, pivot into a new career from an EMBA program, but it might depend on um, what your transferable skills are and whether you're going into a consulting firm that appreciates those. So, you know, there's different types of consulting firms. I used to work in strategy consulting. Um, which really we were more of a generalist model, but there are many firms that um, have much more professionalized, you know, sort of niche groups um, that might target uh, specific industries. So let's say you have a really strong healthcare background, for example, um, that might be possible for you, but I would reach out to the EMBA programs that you're interested in and really look at you know, how, how common is it for somebody from this program to pivot into um, a new career? And um, how is it how is it possible for somebody to do that particularly into consulting? One thing you'll find with EMBA programs is that they are really open uh, to questions and talking to potential um, enrollees. So um, what you'll do generally is you can just set up an appointment with one of the admissions officers and send that person your resume and have a chat about the program, whether it's the right fit for you in terms of length, level of experience, and your goals. So that's what I would recommend. Um, okay, hello, uh, you're welcome. Which is a better school for a career in tech? Cornell or Michigan Ross? Hmm. You know, um, I would say that the best resource for that particular um, answer is going to be the career offices at those particular schools. And I also would say, you know, what do you mean by tech? <laughs> so if you're looking at getting a job at, say, you know, uh, Amazon versus one that's in um, electric vehicles. You know, there's lots of different flavors of tech. Um, so I think it's really going to depend on what type of tech, what type of role within tech, and um, where you might be headed. Because I can imagine that Michigan Ross 
might be a great place to work uh, in, you know, sort of automotive technology. Um, but I know that they also have lots of uh, internship programs with uh, Amazon and similar places. So um, I think it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, reach out to those schools and look at the way that they operate their programs, you know, what kind of um, projects and courses that you might be able to take. Um, but they might both be good options. You just have to kind of dig in with their career services office. Um, while deciding business school, should you consider your past experience, domain of experience, or just what you want to do after MBA? Hmm. Uh, well, that's kind of a tricky question. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I think, I mean, if you're looking to stay within the same industry, you know, <laughs> it sounds like you might be wanting to pivot. Um, so you're asking, you know, how useful is my past experience for these MBA programs? And um, I think that's going to depend. I mean, uh, it depends on what you're looking to get out of the program. Let's say you want to go to Harvard, which is where, um, you know, I can speak to some experience. Um, your past experience definitely comes up in the class because it's case method. So I would say any case method school, your past experience will be important, um, as well as what you're trying to do in the future, just for the learning of the entire class and um, exploring different issues. But it might come in in the finance class, or it might be like a management or leadership issue. It kind of just depends. Um, so I guess, yeah, I hope I answered that uh, reasonably well. If I didn't, um, you can always set up a consultation with, with me or with one of my colleagues, and I'm sure we can dive into the exact specifics of your own uh, background. Um, are there any EMBA programs that allow us to work while in the program? Oh yeah, most of them. I would say it's pretty rare for an EMBA program um, Oh, wait, are you talking about walk, working at the same time? Normally, EMBA programs are when you are fully employed. Um, and so those programs, you will be working while you're in them for the most part. There are a few programs where they are more of a full-time focus. Um, the Sloan Fellows program at MIT, for example, the MSX program at Stanford. Um, those are more immersive one-year programs, but again, usually people are staying within, if not the same company, then at least the same industry and, um, and doing that. If you're asking about are there like internship programs that happen in EMBA programs, I'm not really too familiar with too many of those. Usually EMBA programs are going to be ones where you're a senior executive looking to enhance your skills for the company or the industry that you're in. So. Um, okay, you've got five years of work experience in software product development, and you want to get into product management post MBA. Um, is there any drawback in choosing a school on the East Coast versus the West? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the employer that you're trying to get the role with. Um, I think lots of East Coast schools place well into um, product management roles, but you'd have to look at the career services offices to figure out which ones. And oftentimes they'll publish like a list of the top employers and you want to ask, okay, well, you know, um, you can often call and reach out and say, you know, oh, geographically, where are these? Because, you know, for example, this isn't East or West Coast on your list, but like McCombs, um, a lot of the tech jobs that, you know, it may be, Google, but it might be Google in Austin. So um, I think it really depends on what kind of product management, what kind of company, and what kind of inroads their placement offices have to those particular roles and offices. So I would reach out to the particular schools. But I would say that you know tech is certainly like a growing industry and hires from everywhere. Um, are any thoughts on a prospective candidate applying without a current role given the recent layoffs? Yeah, um, I think um, I totally understand, like definitely have um, um, seen a lot of recessions and layoffs uh, in my day. Um, this may be the first time you guys are up close with one 
Um, but uh, I've been kicking around for a while and I've had uh, a lot of economic downturns that everybody's weathered. Um, and I think the thing to keep in mind if that's happened to you is, um, you know, you definitely want to stay involved and sharpen your skills and stay active, but the schools are re really understanding about that kind of situation. And um, it's very common for people to go to business school during a time when uh, the job market might be um, tough or they might be laid off to retrain or to pivot industries. So the schools know this. Um, I think if you're straightforward and honest with them, you know, you don't wanna hide or lie about that kind of thing, um, but just be very upfront. There's opportunities to do that where sometimes the application will have a section called employment gaps or uh, there may be a spot in the optional essay and you'll obviously be submitting your resume too, but I think they're very understanding of that. Um, and keep in mind, by the way, due to the coronavirus, um, you know, there's a lot of um, international students or other students who may not be able to um, arrive on campus in the timing that they had originally planned. So there are some schools, if you've been recently furloughed and you wanna pivot sooner rather than later into business school, there's not a ton of time left, but there are some schools with um, applications still open in round three to start in the fall. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, how old is too old for a full-time program? 29 to 30 for U.S. schools too old, LOL. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it's um, too old, but I would say that it's, you know, it's definitely getting up to there to where you're at the point, once you have like 10 years of experience, it might be less of a fit for you. Um, then maybe leaning toward more of a part-time program, which is a variety of ages. Um, you might not want to leave your career um, or the EMBA programs, which might have, you know, 10, 12, 15 years of experience. So I would not say that it's too old, but I would say that it's not like the super majority of your class for sure. I would say the vast majority is going to be four, five, six years. And then once you start getting to around nine or 10, um, there's going to be fewer people there with that level of experience, but it's not impossible. I work with clients um, every year who have that level of experience and they go to business school. So, you know, it, it kind of, um, it, it depends on the program in your own situation, but, um, and also whether you're interested in, in sharing class time with people who may have less experience than you. Sometimes that's a turnoff. I had one client who had thought he wanted a full-time MBA program and then ended up going to an EMBA and was really happy that he chose that because it was sort of a better level for him. He had maybe 12 years of experience. Okay, um, how much of an advantage do underrepresented minorities have in the application process to full-time MBA programs? Ah, um, an advantage. Um, you know, there's an amazing program, I don't know if you're familiar with it, called the Consortium um, here in the US. And um, that is incredible if you qualify for that. You do have to qualify first for Consortium membership, which is like a qualifying status um, by demonstrating that you've worked to advance um, the causes of underrepresented minorities somehow in your activities or work or something like that. So if you've done any activities on boosting representation or advocacy or um, anything like that, um, certainly look into that program for sure. Um, they have a streamlined application process at many top schools. Uh, many top schools are members, not all of, not everybody is in the consortium, but a lot of top schools are. And if you, um, if you apply, you rank, you know, your top choices of schools and you may end up with a full ride to business school, which is incredible. I've had several clients get this. Um, and it's um, an amazing opportunity to um, fund your tuition and get a really amazing education um, in business school. So that's a huge advantage at those programs. And I would say that even if you don't necessarily get the scholarship, sometimes people, you know, they maybe don't fully qualify for the most amount of money in that. Maybe they haven't been quite as active. 
um, but they still can use it to apply. It's the lower cost of applying to business school. You kind of get extra events and attention through that program. So I would say that brings you an advantage. And I think it gets you sort of a second look um, by the admissions committee. But, you know, that being said, it's like you still have to um, uh, show that you are ready to perform in that program, right? So they're not going to take somebody with significantly you know, less experience or lower um, qualifications, there may be a small, you know, boost, um, as they would give to anybody that they were really trying to attract with unusual, you know, geographic background or perspectives. Um, but um, yeah, I suggest that you look into that. For the other schools, it may vary. Um, but I think that everybody's, um, all of these programs are interested in, in boosting uh, representation for um, people who have been underrepresented in business. They all want to do that. So um, just by how much, you know, there may be more money attached with some programs than others. Uh, that's it. Any final advice? Yeah, just I recommend that you go to our website and take advantage of the many, many resources there. Um, you know, we have a free consultation. If you want to talk to one of us more in depth about your own profile, you submit your resume and your target schools and your goals. And we get a, th you get a free 30 minute chat with one of us. We're happy to give you whatever, um, insights we can on the process or any part of it. Um, and, uh, thanks so much. Um, this rec yes, this presentation is being recorded and um, everybody should be getting it afterwards. So um, thanks so much. Good night.